I'll see you guys in the dark. This is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. And what makes it worse is that had things gone down differently, I might not have been here to tell the story. Okay, first things first. I'm a girl, about 5'7", and around 130 pounds. This happened to me about three years ago, when I was in my early 20s, and still a student, living in a very safe area. Growing up, I had loved martial arts, and having grown up in a small, rural town, I'd take what I could get. Karate? Fine. Judo? Sure. Kung Fu? Why the hell not? Taekwondo? Sign me up. I loved martial arts, and I still do, because they helped me discipline my body and my mind, and grow my confidence. It had been a few years since I moved out to my country's capital to study, and I had a kind of falling off the martial arts wagon at the point, with college taking up most of my time. I should also mention that at the time, I lived with my younger brother and our cat. We lived on the first floor, the second floor for all my American people, right next to a military camp and a patch of forest which leads to a creek. On our back balcony, there was a circular metal ladder that would lead up to our balcony and the kitchen door, which, of course, we always kept under lock and key, except for when the cat wanted to go out. Then we'd unlock the door, and we would go down the outdoor metal stairs to find his cat friends and play. I commuted to college every day by walking 30 minutes to a bus stop, then riding the bus for an hour, and then walking another 10 minutes until I made it to campus. And when it was time to go home, I'd have to do the same thing all over again. So as you can imagine, it was very tiring. I would be out of the house every day from 10 in the morning, almost until 10 at night. So when I'd come home, I'd be pretty tired. I don't believe in premonitions much, but I do believe in instinct, and for quite a while, I felt like something was up with that patch of forest behind our apartment. I felt watched. Maybe it was the blackness of that patch of forest that made me feel uneasy, because there wasn't a single light there, and the outdoor ladder looked like it descended into an abyss. You could take three steps into that patch of forest, and you'd be under complete cover of darkness. It made me feel weird because even though I couldn't see anything, I knew that something was up. I had no proof, but I just knew it. I was in class one Wednesday afternoon when my best friend at the time and a professor came in to pitch an internship to us. Internships aren't very well known in my country, so professors actually have to argue their case about why, as students would benefit from this. My best friend, I'll call her Kay, was very interested, but when the professor listed off the requirements, she realized that she couldn't apply, as her GPA wasn't high enough. This led to Kay having a crying fit after the class was over, which led to a panic attack, and it got so bad that she called her boyfriend to come pick her up from campus. And since I didn't want to leave her alone, I stayed with her until her boyfriend showed up and got in his car with her. The conversation in the car was basically me and her boyfriend trying to console her and help her cheer up. I asked her if she'd like me to go over to her place so that we could all hang out, but she said that she was okay and didn't want to put me through the hassle of commuting home the next day. She lives a full hour away by car, so two hours away by public transport. So it was decided that they would just drop me off at my house, and they'd go to theirs. We got to my house around 1900, a full three hours before I normally come home. I hug her, and I tell her to text me if she needs anything. I thanked her boyfriend and got out of the car, glad that I'll be home early for a change. I went in through the main entrance, climbed up the stairs to the first floor, and put my key in the lock. I opened the door and called out my brother's name like I always did, and got no response. The house was dark except for one light in the room where the front door opened into, and eerily quiet. But I felt my stomach tie into a knot, because even if I couldn't hear anything, I could feel that someone was there, and when my instincts talk, I listen. I turned right and into the hallway that leads into our rooms and I saw my brother's door slam shut hard as soon as I got in the hallway. My brother's room is on the end of the hallway to the left, facing my own room, which is on the right of the hallway. My first thought was that my brother had taken a shower and forgotten to get a towel, so he made a run for it from the bathroom, which is right next to my room. But then I heard a muffled whispering come from his room. It sounded hush and pressing. I still had no reason to be afraid, 
but I was on high alert because I thought my brother and his friends were planning on jumping out of his room and scaring me, and I wasn't about to let them get that satisfaction. So I inch down the short hallway through the darkness, and before I knock on my brother's door, I take a look at my room. It was a fucking mess. My mattress was off my bed. My clothes and my books were all over the floor. My jewelry box was empty and thrown on my bed. All in all, it looked like a tornado had gone through there, and the hushed whispers in the next room sounded extremely pressing and anxious now that I was close, because though I had tried to tiptoe as silently as possible, my steps had been audible. I realized what was happening, and I went ballistic. At that moment, I lost it. My fight-or-flight instinct kicked in, and it kicked fight into maximum overdrive. The words danger, Thebes, fight, hit me like a truck, and I threw my whole weight into my brother's door, busting that door down so furiously you'd think it owed me money. I saw no one in the room, but it was also a mess, and I knew what I heard, so I ran to the balcony door. I ripped the curtain out of my way and went through the open balcony door just in time to catch one of the thieves right before he'd jump off the balcony edge. Looking back on it, he looked like a normal guy. Black hair, normal height, athletic build, big earring on his left ear. But at the time, he looked like a fucking monster to me. A vile, putrid, home-invading piece of shit thief monster. I started screaming unintelligible things as I saw him stumble around, obviously having hurt his legs. Before he got back on his feet and ran away, they were gone. I was safe. But then it hit me. Where the fuck was my laptop? I ran into my room and tore the place apart looking for my laptop. It was gone. I started screaming and crying. The unfairness, audacity, and the cowardice hit me like a steel toe to the stomach. I screamed and cried like I was in a Grecian tragedy. I'm not rich by any means, and neither is my family. I had an old laptop, which was probably worth pennies second hand. But I needed that laptop for schoolwork, and without it, I couldn't finish my semester. Not to mention that I don't have any real-life friends, and the majority of my friends at the time were online. So if I lost that laptop, I lost them too. My laptop was lost, and so was I. I felt violated, dirty, and less than. I was afraid I'd throw up, or pass out, or maybe both. I was taking such rapid and deep panic breaths that my vision began to blur. In the most panic and grief-stricken state that I've ever been in my life, tears streaming down my face. I called my mother to tell her what had happened, and she told me to call the police. It took me almost a full minute on the phone with the operator telling her again and again where I lived, who I was, and what had happened before she understood me, and said that she'd send someone over. A few days later, I was talking with my mother about the incident, and she told me something that hit me hard. I come from a pretty much a trilingual household, and she told me that when I called her that night, she couldn't make out what language I was speaking because I had been so panicked. Makes sense why I had to repeat myself over and over to the operator. I started running around the house like a lunatic, checking every door and every lock in a frenzy, until I got to the kitchen and saw that the window had been broken. Without thinking, I slammed it shut. Stupid, I know, but I was beside myself. I wasn't thinking straight. My brother came home a few minutes later, and when he came in, he saw me panicked crying my eyes out and speaking almost unintelligibly. He came to the bedrooms and he saw the damage, told me to go sit in the living room and just calm down. I did as he said and tried to calm down, but I jumped at every sound and started crying worse, telling him I was sorry that I got home too late and that our laptops were gone. The house seemed too big to me at those moments, so dark and so hostile, and I felt so small and helpless. My brother called me over to my room and showed me a pillowcase full of something. And when we looked inside, we found both laptops, all my jewelry, fake all of it, my phone, and some other stuff. They had been right in front of me the whole time, but I was so messed up that they didn't even register. The police eventually came an hour later and did fuck all. So my brother and I took it to the police station and filed a report of the incident. And since I have seen half of the culprit's faces, they asked me to come in for identification. They even sent over someone to dust for fingerprints. Nothing ever came of it, of course. The police said that since they didn't even have a backpack to put the loot in, and resorted to using one of our pillowcases, they were almost 100% junkies. 
We had the outdoor metallic ladder ripped off of our kitchen balcony. Much of my cat's displeasure, though, since that's how they get in. They also installed several motion-detecting lights. For the next few months, I was constantly on edge, and every time I passed near some suspicious characters who hang around my usual bus stop, I felt a violent rage boil in me. I caught myself looking for the man that I had seen, ready to beat him within an inch of his life. But I never saw him or heard his creepy whisper partner again, and my brother and I moved away from that apartment a few months later because I never felt comfortable in that apartment again. I picked up kickboxing, and because it made me feel stronger, it helped me feel safer, and I also carried a knife with me now. I still think back on that encounter and realize how stupid I was. What creeps me out the most is knowing that that night, there had been nothing but a thin plywood door separating me from two potentially dangerous men. Even if I know that me busting in my brother's room like a lunatic is what scared them off because of how stupidly fearless I was. I also realized how bad it could have gone. They could have had guns. They could have had knives. They could have had pepper spray, or a chain, or whatever else. And there were two of them, and only one of me. And if they ganged up on me, even with the adrenaline having turned me into Doom Guy, I didn't know how much of a chance I realistically stood against two men, high on whatever they were on, and desperate enough to break into an apartment and stuff loot in a pillowcase. Had they been willing to put up a fight, this could have ended very, very badly for me. What I do know is I probably still would have bust in there like the Doom Guy. So, to the creepy, cowardly bastards who dared break into my apartment and tried to rob me and my brother, and ended up traumatizing me so bad that I had to move, fuck you both. I hope for your sake we never meet again, because I have been kicking that sandbag for two years now, and picturing your face every single time that I do it. This story happened more than ten years ago, when I was still a student. It has a few graphic details of animal harm and graphic violence, so discretion is advised. A bit of backstory. As with most students, I was always broke and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. One of them was house and pet sitting. I have always had a love for animals. So when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned from their overseas trip, as the last sitter has bailed on them, and their six-month-old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I jumped at the opportunity. The fact that they promised to pay me the full two-week fee for staying there less than a week made it more appealing. Little did I know how bad it would turn out. I got the details, got the keys from the agent, and headed over to the house, as it already was after 5 p.m. and almost dark, as it was early springtime. I got to the house, which was a really nice place, but it bordered a not-so-good area that was, and still is prone to crime. House break-ins, robberies, things like that. It did not bother me much, because, you know, nothing will happen to me. I know, young and naive. The first four nights went without a hitch, watching movies, jacuzzi, and just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day, fairly late at night. I went over to check on the doggo. I got a call from them about 10 p.m., saying their flight got delayed. They were going to stay in a hotel and do the three-and-a-half-hour drive back the following morning, and asked me if I could sleep there again that night, which was already fine. I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. I called my dad to let him know of the plans, as I was still staying with my parents, and he specifically asked what the address was. I normally did not give them details like that, because I was old enough to look after myself. I still believe to this day that probably saved my life. I eventually got to bed about 1 a.m., and it felt like I have only slept about five minutes when I was woken to a window breaking, and I could hear movement and what sounded like footsteps running down the hallway. The first thing I did was grab my phone and just hit redial. Thanks to my old Motorola phone, redialing was as simple as pressing one button. As my dad was the last number that I had called, hoping that he wakes up from the call, I then drop the phone in between the headboard and mattress in case my dad picks up, that he can hear what is going on. I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see his silhouette, and he had a knife in his hand. When he saw me, he raised it and came at me. 
Now, one thing to those that is unfamiliar with South African and the crime there is that robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent. People get murdered or tortured if they are in the slightest or retaliate or not cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me, and when he came within reach, I kicked both legs out as hard as I can. Now, I'm not a small guy. I'm six foot three, and at that stage, I weighed about 100 kilograms, or 220 pounds, and I was fit and strong. My time not spent at university or at work was at the gym. I could do an easy 250-pound bench, 350-pound squat. When I kicked and made contact with a guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get up, I was on top of him, driving my right knee into his face, and in return, his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on this, so I put in extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes, but before I could get up, I heard the sound of a pistol cock, and I froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body, and I became numb. I remember the only thing that went through my head was that if he shot me, I would rather die than be disabled or dependent on other people that will have to take care of me. He stood like that with the pistol against my head for what felt like hours, but was probably less than 10 seconds. I did not move, and he eventually said in a very broken English to get on the bed, face down. I panicked, but thought if he wanted to shoot me that he already would have done so. So I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me, and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall just so that if they wanted to stab me, that I had my legs and arms in front to protect my body. Now by that time I had forgotten that I had called my dad, and the guy that I'd need is still down. I heard a third guy come into the room, and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me. I could not understand what they said, but I recognized it. As we used to go to Mozambique on holiday a lot, and that is the main language spoken there. The one guy tried to get the guy that I put down off the ground, while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a big bag. It was about at this time that I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mach 1. The car skidded to a halt right in front of the gate, and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. Now I know my dad missed them on purpose, because if he wanted to hit them, he would have as he is not one of, but the best shot that I know. And I'm not just saying that because he is my dad. He is an ex-Army Military Special Forces. Represented SA in the Clay Pigeon World Championship a couple of years ago. Has various regional pistol and rifle championship titles, and is a gunsmith by occupation. I have seen him hit golf balls at 50 meters with his pistol. Politics and the racial situation in the country would have had him in big trouble had he hit one of them. I grabbed the house keys and pressed the gate remote, and my dad called the police while he came in. I met him at the front door, and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there. Some excuse of no vehicle available. By that time, I had calmed down and started to look for the dog. I could not find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard, and as I got to the corner, I could see her lying on the ground. I got to her and saw that she was dead. Later autopsies revealed that she was poisoned, and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning is pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or area that is targeted for a break-in or a robbery. I was fuming and so sad. The police also were pretty useless and had a don't-give-a-shit attitude. Barely took our statements as well. By that time, it was starting to get light, and I retrieved my bag, phone, and locked the house as good as I can without touching anything, and drove home behind my dad. Only when I got home, I got the story from my dad's side. He said he answered my call, only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on. And when I did not respond, he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily, he asked me for the address the previous night and he knows the area well to know exactly which house it is. Now my dad got there pretty quickly, and he said he stayed on the line the whole time, only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents' house is about 10 kilometers, or 6 miles from there, through a residential area. It's normally about a 20-minute drive, 
The call duration was only 7 minutes and 13 seconds. I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, they took fingerprints, etc., and the owners got back about the same time. The rest of the day was a blur, as I came down from the shock and adrenaline. Now that is not where the story ends. About seven or eight months later, I got a call from the detective, telling me they caught the guys, and I must come to a lineup to point them out. I specifically told them that I did not see any of their faces, as it was dark, and after the guy held the gun against my head, I was under the blanket, and did not see anything. She assured me that they caught them on fingerprints, and will show them to me beforehand. Which may not be the correct way to do it, but they wanted to have as much evidence as possible against them. You will understand why in just a moment. I got to the station. And unlike what you see in movies, there is no one-way glass or separate room. They bring the three guys into the room and make them stand against the wall. The one which I was later told was the leader, which was the one that I had need, looked at me with so much hate as I have never seen in my life. He had the eyes of someone that would slit your throat and not blink an eye. His name was Joseph Dragon Sambo. He pulled his hand to his neck and made the slit my throat gesture. You know which one that I mean. We left the room and the detective gave me a copy of his rap sheet. Amongst others, four counts of murder, I think eight or nine attempts for murder, multiple assault, aggravated assault, over a hundred house break-ins and robberies, rape. I was shocked. The detective told me that I had not taken him out first and fast that night. I would have definitely not have gotten away so lightly. Now this is also not where the story ends. Three days later, I get another call from the detective, saying that I should be careful, as he has escaped from custody, and they have not caught him yet. I was not worried too much, as the robbery wasn't at my house, and I had changed cars, so he probably would not find me. Also, I got my firearm license and carried my pistol on me 24-7. I did not hear anything after that, until about two years later, when I saw the detective in the grocery shop. We started talking about the case, and she told me that he was killed during a home invasion. He broke into the wrong house, and the owner was waiting for him, pistol in hand. Shot him one in the stomach and one in the neck. And thanks to the slow response time of emergency services and the police, he bled out on the guy's living room floor. Ridding society of a piece of human garbage. I want to add a bit of information on this. All three were caught, and they happened to have been Mozambican nationals. Undocumented, and no fingerprints or ID in the system. Essentially, illegal immigrants. And it is of the opinion in SA that more than 70% of all violent crime is done by illegal immigrants. Mainly Zimbabwe and Nigerian descent. It makes it fairly easy. Because none of those countries have extradition to SA. So if it gets too hot, they just flee back over the border and nothing can be done to them. This whole ordeal has made me more vigilant, heightened my situational awareness, and made me a little more paranoid to double and triple check all doors and locks. Also, thanks to my heightened situational awareness, it has also allowed me to remove myself from a few potential dangerous situations in the years after the incident. But it has also robbed me of my peace of mind. I have since emigrated to a safer country, but I still sometimes wake up at night if I hear a noise. So keep up with tradition. Joseph, we will never meet again as you have passed away. But to his cronies, or anyone that wants to try something similar, please do pay me a visit. I will arrange your swiftly departure and reunion with Joseph in hell. And to Joseph, I hope you died in agony for poisoning that poor dog Daisy. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and hit the bell for notifications on future videos and become a stalker of the night. And I'll see you next time.